clear as can possibly be at this stage. And then what I want to do is give a short lecture uh, that explains or gets into the question of the Enlightenment. What we're we dealing with it. Uh, I think we should just start juggling, juggling balls or anything. <laughs> there we go. That's brilliant. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. If we can just go to page one, the top. Of the page. That's what I love it. Ah, perfect. First thing you'll see on this course outline are these three images. Is, is anybody familiar with the artist's work? Nobody's ever seen this stuff? Who is this? Who's the first one? Who? Who said that? Joe, our person in charge of is very good. Can you say it louder? Because nobody heard of the sound. And also they didn't hear on the recording. That. And what does she do? Uh, I think she's an Iranian artist. Yes. She works a lot with film and performance and work with her body. Okay, good. <coughs> so about, what about the middle one? Helen Chadwick. Helen Chadwick, very good. Yes, Helen Chadwick. Do you know what that's called? Self-portrait. She's <laughs> good at it. Uh, and the last one, anybody know who that is? Alan Gallagher, um, and that's called, I think, I think it's called bird hair, something like that, or maybe just bird. Um, anyway, okay, just no comment on that at the moment. We'll get back to these three things. It'll, it'll creep into the course as we go. It's called Contemporary Philosophy and Aesthetics. Uh, it could have also had the word political in there, Contemporary Political Philosophy and Aesthetics. What this course, in fact, what MAP does, is it tries to get you to understand how you are inhabiting <coughs> different ways of thinking, different ways of, of bodily responding to things, or to put it slightly differently, that your body responses are absolutely linked to the way you think, your rational thought. And that, um, that what comes before intuition is reason. And that's a very different view. So I want you to, to take that on. So there's different types of philosophy. There's mainly three major types. <coughs> there's continental philosophy. There's analytic philosophy. And then there's this thing that I call dirty philosophy. OK, that's what we're doing. You can be happy to know that. And we call it contemporary because it wouldn't pass the, the sort of Sensors from. Contemporary philosophy, when you see the word contemporary philosophy, it means that which does not fit in. <laughs> contemporary, often, not always. <laughs> Aesthetics, in the usual form of philosophy, they cover four types of areas. They cover method, they cover ethics, they cover beauty, and they cover aesthetics, or art. And all traditional forms of philosophy does this. So, you know, just so you know. We're not doing that. Okay. That's why you also have to know that. However, because you're MA students now, you're no longer BA students, you're no longer uh, little people lost in the world, you're now just lost in the world, um, you now need to start finding out about these things. That's what I'm telling you. Now, the course is on 5.15, that's that. Uh, to eight, but it'll probably go to like quarter to eight, uh, but because I think that it's just going to be a lot of information. Uh, it's here. It's 30 credits if you're taking it as a full-time student. It's 15 if you're taking it as a uh, thing, as a uh, option. It's a 2.5 hour weekly thing, so you do the math. You can see it's not going to go all the way to eight, but it might. Um, now, there's two. Methods, as I was explaining, uh, uh, you know, in our longer thing, dialectics and rhizomatic. This course is dealing with dialectics, and I'm not used to not having a board to write on. I feel like I should write this out so you can see it. D I A L E C T I C S dialectics. And of dialectics, there's two types of dialectics that we could call modern form. One is called the Hegelian dialectic, and 
you know, see it in the in the papers as Hegelian, speculative, idealist. We'll get into more of this. And the second is the Marxist dialectic. Historical, you'll hear it as historical materialist, uh, you'll hear it as just Marxist. Um, anyway, those two ways of approaching thinking, or approaching anything, approaching analysis, has underwritten at least 300 years of political, aesthetic, and moral <coughs> positions. And if you're going to be dealing with the information age, they kind of fall short. But you need to know what's going on with them, because they're very useful on some level, like Newtonian physics, useful for certain things, like building a house, like driving a car, but not useful for going into space, or not as useful. OK, so what this talks about, the overview, which I hope you all read, but just so you know, the overview basically is saying that we are enmeshed in a radically weird time. Now, it is fair to say that all times are weird. But this is the time we're in, and it's weird. So it's violent. It's horrific on a lot of levels. The whale being beached, the bombs dropping on people, the fact that they shot that poor little girl in Pakistan because she was you know, arguing for uh, girls to go to school. I mean, the whole thing is just nutty. Uh, so we are in this time period. In, what do you say about it? How do you do art anyway after all this? For any of you who have been involved in prison camps or just at the wrong end of a racist abuse or whatever it is, how do you deal with it? How do you hey, go paint after that? How do you write poetry? That's what Adorno was. How do you write poetry after Auschwitz? How do you do it? And his answer, which we'll find in class, uh, through, is that A, you must do it. You must write poetry after Auschwitz. In fact, you must write it during Auschwitz if you can deal with it. Meaning during the you know the horror, you must learn how to get that distance. You must learn it. That's why I said it's reason. You must learn how to get it. Now, in the olden days or in the not so olden days, they tell you you have to have a thick skin. No, you have to be able. In fact, if you get a thick skin, all that will happen is that you will feel it. But that's not going to work. You need to figure out how to get this distance in order to write poetry, paint, sculpt, not only after Auschwitz, but as new things are being created. So what is what happened that was kind of an interesting problem on the way to problems is that there was a thing called the Enlightenment, which I mentioned before. And in that time period, people began to realize that if you could get a distance, you could move. See, the, one, the minute you can figure out how to get some sort of space somehow, or someone's crowding your space, I mean, I found this out moving here. Uh, there's very different notions of space, personal space, here. Uh, so if I stand you know, too close to someone, they're like, you know, what are you doing? Now I've gotten like that. So if I go back to New York and someone comes next to me, I'm like, you know, do you have an issue? And I feel like, oh. <laughs> uh, people actually think when I'm back in New York that I have an English accent. Fantastic. <coughs> anyway, um, so there are, th I'll, I'll keep circling back to this. I'm going to keep throwing this out. So you just hear it, and then you grab what you can, and you hear it, and grab what you can. Now, the first side then explains how you get this critical distance. That's what it's called. It's called critical distance. Because, you know, too far away, the distance, and you fall off the edge of the earth. Too close, and you can't see what you're doing. So how far, without trying to sound too zen, how far is the distance before it's too far, or not far enough? Now, there are ways of thinking of this. And I'm going to explain to you how this can happen. So if you go to the next page, which is the nuts and bolts of this, um, Okay, okay. Okay, the critical aspect, or okay, the specific aspects, just to continue this, sorry, I, I have to tell you the assessments. Um, I think you've all seen this, but there's a critical book review that's due on the 8th of November. 
um, whether or not it's an option or a core. And I, in the olden days, I would say wherever else I've taught this, um, I graded it, of course. But uh, in this uh, environment, that wasn't appropriate. Uh, I can understand that. So let me explain to you what a book review is. I don't want to know your opinion. I'm sure it's very interesting, your opinion. But what I really want to know is what is the book saying, not what you're saying. And can you say what the book is saying in three pages? There's a guy named Pascal, I've heard of him years and years ago, who wrote very famously, I don't have time to be brief. Okay? Um, you can always tell the longer you work on something and it just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes, you can get you know, here, here's my present. You know, um, no. Three pages, about five if you really can't have help yourself of the whole gist of the book. That is to say, <clears throat> what's the argument? Now, an argument is not uh, whether or not, like I said, whether or not you like it or anybody else likes it, or even that it makes sense. It's literally, what is it trying to tell you, and how does it tell it to you? How does it build? So it's kind of like a plot device. What's the story? How do they get it there? How do they finish? And normally, I ask you to only choose books from that group. If you're obsessed and you have another book that you simply must review, or in fact a film, or in fact to something else, but I'm not used to these books, so it will save you time in the long run. Um, there's Hannah uh, Arendt's The Human Condition, about 200 pages long. There's Theodore Adorno's Negative Dialectics, don't do that. Um, I'm just telling you right now, because we're going to spend like eight weeks on it, and you're, trust me, you, you don't want to go there. Um, there's Walter Benjamin. You can do uh, either the task of the translator. Notice I have not put art in the age of mechanical reproduction. Anybody know that I say art in the age of mechanical reproduction? It's usually the one that teaches in art school. It drives me mad. Um, so the task of the translator. You're translators. You know that, right? You do realize that that's what part of being an artist is you're translating. Uh, and by the way, uh, you know, I have many names, Sue Golding, Johnny Golding, Johnny DeFilo, Johnny Danger, uh, you'll find them all on the web. Johnny DeFilo came because I was a drummer in a band. And, um, but, be but while I was searching for a cool name to have, I was asked to speak in South Africa on the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission on Revenge. And so I was doing all this work on revenge, and then it's blah, blah, blah. blah. It's like spot the problem. White Westerner goes to speak about revenge in South Africa. Okay, well, I don't know what I was thinking, but anyway, so it was a little bit complicated uh, because I should have just said it's out of my depth. But I learned a lot, and one of the things I learned was there was a guy named Philo de Alexandra, Philo from Alexandria, and he wrote in the Babylonian time period, and he tried to answer the question, "What language does God speak?" There's a big debate, you know, does God speak Hebrew, and that's why the Jews are the chosen people. Does God speak, I don't know, whatever language God speaks, and then people hear it, you know, in their own language. That was another huge debate in the Babylonian moment. But Philo de Alexander said, no, God speaks the language of translation. I like that, so I stole it. Okay, so I became Johnny de Philo. Okay, and you too can steal names, just not my name. Okay, but it, so the task of translator gets into that question. Or theses on the philosophy of history, which are 14 of them. Um, and so they're like three pages long. So Rene Descartes, you've heard of the meditations, the first and third meditations. Basically, that's all about Descartes or Cartesianism lines. Of course, poor Descartes, he really just did not say what a lot of people think he's saying. But he just, there's, he's dead. There's nothing you can do about it. I mean, so, but you can take a look at it. See what you think. The gift of death don't do. Too complicated at the moment. Michel Foucault's What is Enlightenment? You can try your hand at that. Uh, Sigmund Freud, very interesting. Uh, introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, dreams, and the unconscious. Did you know that he was frightened of speaking in front of people? And he did most of his work on uh, very stoned on cocaine. Uh, you know this. And in fact, they have a huge thing in the cocaine papers. Um, those were the days. Uh, and he um, basically, and what he uh, would do is pretend an audience was in front of him. So all of his lectures are like, dear ladies and gentlemen. But he's like talking to his chair. 
Okay, um, and you should try it. It does work. You know, it's like writing a diary to yourself. Or do, do you know Harriet or something? You know, it's like this. And what he basically does is he starts to explain in this what, where does the sexual enter into the picture? Not an interesting. Uh, you can look at my thing. You don't do that. Uh, then there's uh, phenomenology. Don't do that. Uh, third critique, don't do Well, you could do that for those of you that have a philosophy background, but I think it will be difficult. Uh, fear and trembling, <coughs> don't do that because we're going to be doing that later. But if you really are obsessed with um, the, you know, Abraham hearing voices and not being called a psychotic uh, and taking and being told to kill his only son and so on and so forth, you want to see what that's about, really see what it's about. Take, take a running fly in it, see what you think. Uh, the thesis on quarterback, two pages long, along with the pre a preface to the critique of political economy, two pages long, and the 18th Brumaire, about five pages long. You're welcome to try your hand at that. Ecce Homo, Why Am I So Wise? Why I Write Such Good Books, uh, a piece of that was in the outline. Hannah Pitkin, uh, The Attack of the Blob, which is totally hilarious. She, she's basically attacking Hannah Arendt by saying that most sociologists and a lot of philosophers and, and cultural theorist types always see the society as this big blob coming at like Marmite coming at you and either you love it or you hate it. You know, it's like that kind of thing. And you've got to get rid of that notion of the blob. You've, you've got to try and come up with it. And so that's kind of an interesting thing. Okay. So continue. Uh, the Melancholy Science by Julian Rose. She is a wonderful philosopher who died of ovarian cancer years ago. Um, but and her work is, uh, well not but, her work is brilliant. Uh, Rage and Time, I have not finished reading that. I think it's an interesting book. I just wanted you to know who Peter Sloterdijk was. Uh, he's kind of the quiet kid on the block. Then there's Mouse, The Survivor's Tale. It's actually two volumes. It's, it's a quote comic book. Does anybody know what this is? Um, this is a very important <coughs> comic book uh, written by Art Spiegelman and someone else whose name I've repressed and left off. Does anybody remember who the other person is? Oh, he's ranking first on the list. That's what happens. <laughs> People don't remember your second, the second name. Anyway, um, it's about uh, his father. He's trying to talk to his father about the concentration camps. And he, you know, people are mice. Uh, the, the Jews are the mice. The Germans are the cats. The Americans are the dogs. Is right? Did I get it right? It says something like Anyway, it is, it is spectacular. He won the Nobel Prize for writing for this. OK, background text. You're also welcome to take any of that. I'm not going to go through them all, but you can see that there's some that are interesting. And if after all this, there is a book that is not on that list that you are compelled to do, you have to come see me beforehand. OK, and I will try and dissuade you. With the possible exception of Wittgenstein's Uncertainty in Mathematics, which is very difficult. Right. Okay, every lecture has a theme, every theme has questions, every question is asking you while you're doing the ironing, while you're painting, while you're drinking, while you're having games, to think about those questions. Wouldn't be a tragedy to do it also very seriously. But the questions to consider on those four frames was what is a ground? What does it mean to be grounded? I feel grounded. I feel beside myself. Do you ever have that expression? I felt beside myself today. I was literally beside myself. Um, why is a ground important? What does the preparing of the ground to do with anything? What is the subject, or for that matter, the object of the ground? Does it matter? And if so, to whom does it matter? A trick question. Do you think this ground has anything to do with the question of time? Yes. And if it does, is time in your thinking continuous or discontinuous? So if you start thinking tick, 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 that's continuous, right? But the tick, and then the next tick, and then the next tick, and then the next tick is discontinuous, right? So already you've learned a very important concept simultaneity. Tick, space, tick, space, tick, distance, tick, distance. How far do I have to get with that distance for the next tick to show up? That's discontinuous logic. But at the same time, it's part of a flow, so it's continuous. 
Got it? Tick, space, tick, space, tick, space. See how that makes discontinuous? Makes distance. Distance is important because if you didn't have that tick, 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 what comes next? Tick comes next. Okay. Tick. Try again. Tick. 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 Very good. How did you know it was tick other than the fact that I told you? Very disturbing. Why would you think that tick came next? Because there's a pattern. And you've been able to read that pattern. I didn't tell you you're actually in base 10. And you're reading it because I'm doing tick, tick, tick and certain, you know. Rhythm. You know, because if I did tick, 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 you wouldn't know. It'd be too crazy. You wouldn't really know what came next. But if I do tick equals space, tick equals space, tick equals space, you know that the next thing is going to be a tick in an equal space. Or it's probably at least going to be a tick in an equal space. More than likely, it's going to be a tick in an equal space. So on the one hand, you see continuity. <coughs> That's called logic. That's called prediction. But it can't happen without those spaces. Sometimes the spaces are equidistant. And sometimes they're not equidistant. So you know, like for example, a pattern. When you think of a pattern, it looks the same, right? You can have a thing that repeats, squares, repeats, squares, repeats, squares. But if I said, oh, look at that cow. It has a pattern of black spots. It's not going to be polka dot, right? It's going to be like a cat. And you're not going to have a problem realizing that there are patterns. You're going to see that those black splotches on the cow are patterns, right? Now, why is this important? It is important because the tick, space, tick, space, tick, space, tick, at the same time of having it all put together taken together is a ground. It gives you your first ability to go, I know what comes next, a tick. For no other reason than that you've heard the pattern. Tick, space, tick, space, tick. And that gives you your first step into figuring out what you want to put in. Because I could do tick, space, tick, space, tree, tick space, tick space, tree. And then you would know after every fourth tick, there'd be a tree. There'd only be a tree because of the, 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 the pattern, that the, 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 the surface that's being created is your ground. Did you get that? The circle, I'll repeat that part because very important. The surface, the surface of the table is your ground. Okay. Yeah. That's just the first thing. I'm not, we'll go back to this, because these are very complex. If you're not getting it, don't have a uh, heart attack yet. OK, the next thing I wanted you to take a look at, or last week's thing, while we were simultaneously doing tick and gram, tick and you know, flow, or Bergson would call it simultaneity and duration, tick and flow, tick and flow. But it's not tick and then flow, and then tick and then flow. There's a flow, and tick is happening. But the tick is not on the flow, right? The tick is happening, tick, 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 tick. The flow is happening, and they're connected somehow. I'll let that lie. That's actually too complex. That's, that you'll, that'll be so easy for you next semester. You'll just listen to that going, and when the first year maze come in again, or the second ones if you've never had this before, you, Okay. It, it doesn't make sense now, but it will. Just think, surface is a ground. You don't have to be standing on the ground to have a surface that acts, or in fact, is a ground. Because why? A ground is the logic that produces predictability. And it's not just any old predictability. I mean, it's not going to work for the lottery. It's going to work for how you're going to put colors together, or how you're going to put different uh, soundscapes together. There's a certain pattern. Let's come back to that. 
Okay, so the last things that I want you to hear before we really get going <coughs> are the two things by Nietzsche. Conviction, it's basically about conviction. Does anybody in this room have any convictions? I don't mean being arrested. I mean, do you have a conviction like, does anybody have it? Okay, great. <laughs> and name? Vanessa? Vanessa has a conviction. What is it? Love. It's love. Yeah. It's, is it love in general or particular love? Life. See, she's already got the tick, tick, tick in the flow. It's both love in general and... And how would you characterize that conviction? How do you explain it? Would you do anything for that love? Uh, love for action. What's that? Like. Would you do anything for that love? Like, let's say this love was being taken away from you. Would you do anything for it to keep it? You'd wait for it. Fight for it. You'd fight for it. How would you fight for it? Say. Think about it. I feel like we're in Fight Club now. Did we see that film? I'm a club. Do you want to go to fight school or not? You know. Okay. Um, what would you do for your conviction? How, how far would you go? Would you go kill someone? Abraham believed in, you know, God. I mean, fair enough. God tells him, look, you know, you were too old anyway. Don't believe it when you have this child. Prove that you love me because I'm an insane bipolar God. And I'm going to ask you to kill your only son. And I'm going to ask you to do it by burning him to death. Great. <laughs> Don't question me. And Abraham, because of his conviction, said, okay. Anybody have any problems with that? He wasn't able to tell Sarah, his wife. By the way, you know, he did have another son. They didn't count that other son. Do you know what the other son's name was? Ishmael. Ishmael. Good. People know their religious history is important. Ishmael, why didn't they count Ishmael? Little Ishmael, why didn't he count? What's that? Yeah, what's the matter with Hagar? What was wrong with her problems? She was a A what? A concubine, or a slave. She was a slave, actually. Worse than a concubine in that sense. She was a slave. <coughs> and he had sex with her. And, oh well, she had got pregnant. And while that was, in fact, a son, and in fact his son, in fact his only son, she was a slave. And if you didn't believe that you could, if Hagar wasn't able to break out of that thing called slave, she had to maintain that thing called slave, and had to go, well, darn, you know, my son wasn't good enough for you because I was a slave, but Sarah, who is 90, I think, when she had the child, which is fantastic. Nobody raises these things. These rapid right-wing thinkers do never raise the question when women have babies at 50 and 60 years old. They don't raise the issue of, of Sarah having a child at 90, which is, you know, even in biblical terms, it's extreme. Anyway, um, okay, sorry, that was a tangent. The, the point is, about the question of conviction. Think about it. What would you do to save something because you felt a conviction about it? Now, we're gonna, I'm gonna try the sneaky approach, which is the love thing. Um, you have a child. The child, I don't know how many of you have children, but the child is snatched away, just gone. One day they're gone the next. And you know that someone's taken the child. Would you do everything to get that child back, including finding that man or woman or whoever took the child and shooting and killing them. Would you do that? How far would you go? Or let's say, what would you do if your child's killed or your child's <coughs> taken away from you? Do you go, oh, well, think the painting needs blue? You know, what, what do you do? What do you do when that happens, when that level of emotional crud Stops. You're walking down the street and someone assaults you. You're doing nothing. You're going to your car. What do you do? What, what, what's, the, what's, the act, what's the reaction? Fight back. And what do you do to fight back? You strike out. And how do you strike out? Uh -huh. Okay, so if I decide I've been having a really tough day, and I want people who saw me in my office before Hannah had to run out and get me food before I died, um, if I just decided to throw this table off. I realize we're filming on it, but if I decided that wouldn't work, would it? I mean, it might work. I might break my foot in doing it. Uh, it might cause some of the frustration. 
there should be some form of outrage about this, I think, on some level. I mean, you know, let, look, in England, do you know, uh, the, in case you ever read history books, that they uh, say that up until, I think it was 1924, <coughs> I can't remember exactly the date, uh, girls as young as nine would be prostitutes in this country. That is young, sorry. You know, there's just no getting around that one. That's young. You know, now, how did that change? How did that change? Did, yeah. Name? Johnny. Someone's Johnny without the age. Just um, can we just speak now? Just like you know, you're saying, I'm saying about the individual, say everyone has their own moral grounds. But that's what Louise said. He basically said, you know, okay, so let's, let's, let's again park this because I don't want to get too bogged down in this kind of, because the thing about philosophy is that it can easily get a serious headache. Now, you're going to get it anyway, but you might as well have more in there before you do it. So, uh, Nietzsche is angry about this problem of conviction. I put him on because I actually love reading Nietzsche. This is what I read for bedtime reading, sadly. Um, I know I have to get out more. But it is actually fabulous. Who writes that? I mean, Ecce Homo is such, Ecce Homo, E-C-C-E, -C -C -E, Homo, H-O-M-O. -O. Any Italians in here? Any Germans? I'm Italian. Okay. What does this mean? Taken. E-C-C-E, -E, space Homo, H-O-M-O. Italian. <laughs> what is E-C-C-E-H-O-M-O? E-C-C-E, -E, space, H-O-M-O. What's your name? John. John. Oh, that's great. Shortage of names here. I'm John A. There's John A. There's John. It's good. Okay. Um, say it again. Look at the man. Look at the man. Close. I, yes? Is it here is man? Here, here is man. man. This man. This. The word this is the crucial thing, not man here. This thing. This man and no other. We're going to make pronouncements on what it is to be human, and then suddenly everyone can be what they want to be. This is, we've got to figure this out here. Okay, we've got to just figure this one out. It's not that complex, but it's not. Okay. Nietzsche, who I might have mentioned this, and every time I talk about Nietzsche, I will always tell the story, so if you get sick of it, let's do something, wave. Nietzsche, as you may know, uh, died of syphilis, died of. Uh, a uh, syphilitic condition where it made him go blind and insane. Did people know that? I think these things are very important about people you read. I don't know, maybe I'm just a gossip queen. But <coughs> he got uh, syphilis because obviously he was having a lot of sex with people, or even sex with one person. Anyway, he, he got syphilis. And he wrote a book called, well, a book is attributed to him called My Sister and I, which is the, quote, real version of this man. And uh, there's a huge controversy about it. There's a 100-page uh, preface saying it's ridiculous. You could never write this. We've analyzed his handwriting. It's against the person. You know, anyway, if he did write it, he was insane. You know, just in case he did write it, you know, so it's a, it's a terrible book. You know. Now, I just want to preface that by saying that when he was carted away to the sanatorium, he was in a very high uh, garret of some kind, a very very romantic garret, writing his you know ancient homo thing. And he looked out and he saw a man flogging a horse, which was very tired. The horse was very tired. And he was flogging this, and, and, the, and the horse fell down on its knees, and the man kept flogging the horse. And finally, Nietzsche couldn't handle it any longer. And he ran down the five flights of stone stairs, grabbed a whip out of the guy's hand, and killed him. And held the horse's head in his hand, and the horse died in his arms. And then they carted him off to his lap. And they decided he was crazy. That, that was the first sign of him being crazy. Anyway, I mention this to you because, again, he sort of had a point. Maybe he didn't need to kill the guy. That, that was extreme. But he was flogging this poor horse. He then writes conviction, my conviction, this man. Should I have just been a witness, or do I step up to the plate? this man and no other. Which, when do you become this man? Here, now. Well, that question
question was raised, or was able to be raised, we're now moving into the lecture for today. Are you ready to move into the lecture for today, or do you need a break? You okay? All good? Okay. Now, hopefully, you have read uh, nothing. Do I not have anything down there to read? <coughs> you should have read uh, Foucault. Oh, the way this works is that it should have the readings read by the day the lecture happens, not after the lecture. I know life. I know being a student. You probably will never read them half the time. But the principle of it is to read it before the lecture so that you can get more out of the lecture. Some of us are able to access Moodle at the moment, so. Oh, really? Okay. Send me your emails and I'll send them to you. Thank you. Yeah. Because um, that's not good. Is that because you're not enrolled? Are you having problems <coughs> at the community? I think it's confusing because I have to leave the course and then I'm going back onto it. So oh, okay. Also talk to Henry. Yeah. Henry knows everything. He's, he's our man in charge of this kind of thing. That's right. Okay. You needed to read Foucault's What is Enlightenment, Honor Arendt's Cartesian Doubt, and forget that one. You don't need to read that. That's just an option. How many people read any of that? Oh my god! This side of the room. It's with this side of the room. Okay, one person read on so. Okay. Let me now explain to you where all of this is going, and hopefully it makes a little bit of sense here. Uh, in 1794, <coughs> I think, Kant answered an ad in the paper. I mentioned this as the methods thing. The question was, what is the Enlightenment? It was asked in the news in the Kronenberg uh, newspaper. In the same way that you would get, like, I don't know, you know, uh, what's it called, uh, monkey, survey monkey, you know, coming up on your little screen going, what do you think about blah, you know, and millions of people in our day and age would respond, but in that time period, maybe only hundreds responded. First of all, not a lot of people would read. Second of all, they, you know, it was less of a distribution situation. Now, something monumental had happened in order to raise that question. Something so monumental that it changed the very ground of the social, of the society. And that was the printing press. The Gutenberg printing press. <coughs> because suddenly you could produce something that made it faster. It didn't take five million years to write like three pages with a nice script and then carefully carry it and you know only the monks could have access to it. Suddenly, you could have this thing that you could produce pamphlets and books, which meant that maybe someone would read them, which meant that maybe people had to get educated. There's a lot of knock-on effects of this printing press. Does anybody is anybody old enough? or young enough to know what a Gestetner is? Yay. No, it's not a photocopier. <laughs> what is a Gestetner? And name? Yeah. Oh, you were going to say photocopier. Ah, yeah. oh, no. A Gestetner, yeah. What name? Simone. It's not wax. It's got blue ink in it. And it smells fantastic. And so if you ever need to get an altered experience, I guess Denver is your place. And you can do tons of things. Of course, you have to sit there like this. you know. But lots of papers can come out, and you can make whole books. This is the, print, the beginning of the printing press. For those of you that are curious about this way in which this question of the Enlightenment gets formed, read, for example, Victor Hugo's uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. The Hunchback of Notre Dame, in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, or Notre Dame, sorry, out of name. <laughs> I don't know how they could think I had a first accent. Anyway. In The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the question is, how did society tell their stories before the printing press? 
Answer, the stories were told by architecture. The public stories, you could look at a building and you could get a sense of what that society was about. And what Victor Hugo argues, interesting book for a book review, is that it's the printing press that killed architecture. Now, I'm not suggesting you have to run with this. I'm just saying that what happened was that some things were very, became very different. This massive, the, the, the ability to produce mass was becoming part of this thing where people were becoming able to walk around. And this created the question. Because people were saying they lived in the age of the Enlightenment. They weren't talking about Buddha. They weren't talking about Aquarius. They were saying that something is happening where we live in an enlightened age. Answer the question, 25 points. And a lot of people wrote back, and Kant was one of them, Immanuel Kant. Now, what Kant said, as I ended up the methodology talk on, he said, really, what the Enlightenment is, is Saperi Aude, dare to know. But a little bit more to this, it's realizing that you can dare to know. And that if you do dare to know, it is conceivable, although not probable, depending on where you are in the food chain, that you will not be killed. But it is equally conceivable that you will be. So you can dare to know all you want till the cows come home, but you might want to keep the daring to yourself if you're living in a very oppressive environment. And that becomes the question. When does that oppression take a societal leap? When does it, what pushes it? So I ask this question, I ask it this way, because it is connected to this very early thing I was talking about before with how the space Thing gets established, how space, how spacings work, and how spacings are intimately connected with time and timing. Tick, 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 space, tick, space, tick, 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 tick. This kind of timing thing. Now, there was one more piece of the puzzle that you need to hear. And I'm sorry that I don't, I'll, I'll figure out how to do this better when I have. But, I mean, there's no whiteboard. This is a, there's never a whiteboard here, right? There's, you can't draw on this. <laughs> I mean, for an art school, it seems amazing. You can't draw somewhere. And it's like, <laughs> draw on. Okay. Okay, so in your minds, you're going to learn the word telos. And you're going to see what it looks like. And you're going to learn the words, um, oh, what's the other word? Um, Telos. Let's just stick, uh, let's just stick with telos for funding. And just write this down. This is a nuts and bolts thing. Telos means the goal, the process, and the start. Goal, process, start. Goal, process, start. There's the goal. You start walking toward that goal. And that goal gives you your ability to get going. You have a goal, you start going toward the goal, and that going toward that goal is the start. So it's all wrapped up together. Goal, purpose, start. Goal, purpose, start. Like a spiral. Process? Process. What is process? You said, you just said process. Oh, what did I mean to say? No, I mean, before you said process. What did I say before? So purpose. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, process for the, for the movement part, goal or purpose for the goal part. OK, sorry. Thank you. Okay. So goal, you have purpose because you're going to your goal. Your, your purpose is your goal. Yeah. You're going to it, that process, that gets you there. Well, I want to go to that blue curtain. I have two legs. They function. I can walk to that curtain. That's my goal. 
And in fact, the walking there is giving me my reason for being. It's giving me my purpose. It's giving me, you know, someone saw me and said, what are you doing? I had to say, I'm walking toward the curtain. Hey, it's as good as any reason, you know. What are you doing in life? I'm walking toward the curtain, right? That's what you're doing. And you know, better be aware of that. Because the other thing you should remember is like, you know, there's old saying, you know, be nice to your body, someday it'll rise up and kill you. You know, <laughs> and other really pleasant, I'm just really full of good news here today. Sorry. Um, I had a very long day, so you anyway. um, Okay. The telos has been part of 2,000 years of understanding how something happens. That understanding how something, that long part, understanding how something happens, 2,000 years of understanding how something happens, has a name, has a short name, very good spelling for Scrabble, metaphysics. Metaphysics, M-E-T-A, physics. Meta, above, physics, the ground. Meta, physics, is the way in which one would understand there's a goal and you go toward it. You're born and you think, what do I want most of all as this little baby? I want the breast. That's what I want. I want to feed. I want my, this is Freud, I'll tell you this. That your first act of consciousness is to not have a consciousness. It's to just want that breast or whatever it is that's when it feeds you. It doesn't act literally be a breast. And that thing, you just are the same thing. And that's your goal. You wake up in the morning, breast. Now some people never get out of that. Okay? It's just, that's what they go for. It's, I'm serious. That's the part of the thing. And Freud calls that being stuck in the oral phase. You can tell if you're stuck in the oral phase, if you smoke, if you tend to put pens in your mouth, if you can't keep things out of your mouth. Still have that goal, hasn't been resolved yet. Okay. Then again, there's the goal of anal repression, you know, toilet draining problem. Because as a child, I'm going to go into this more, but as a child, you have a gift to give to your parent, but you don't have a lot of gifts. Because you know, you're not working. So the only gift you really have that's really, truly yours, guess what it is? <laughs> Shit. And that gift, for those of you who have not quite gotten over that, is the basis of being an artist. Here's my shit. Let them really show you my shit. And Bataille has a word for that. It's called experimental philosophy. And that was a very big movement that was underwriting surrealism and Dada. All of that was about the importance of one's own shit. In fact, people were doing shit paintings. And not with just, you know, dung from animals. Their own shit. Okay, because what else did you have to give? And can you imagine the annoyance when your parents said, excuse me, will you stop painting your crib with this stuff? And you are shocked and realize that something has gone very badly wrong and that they don't understand your shit and that now there's a problem. And that problem is that either you react by becoming extremely neat, that's called anal retentive. So nothing comes out, okay? Very neat person. Or you really are annoyed and you're a slob. Okay, and you just have all your shit everywhere, all the time. And if people can't handle your shit, well then, that's just too bad, isn't it? Okay, so this kind of thing is all tied up with telos, with going for something. There's a lot of people that have this in their repertoire, all the way up to four. That you have this, this thing that comes back around and gives you impetus to go forward. This is crucial thing. Now, if that's the case, as I said before, how do you know when to say no? How do you do it? What, how does that happen? Do you have to be slacker on the head? And a lot of people think this. I mean, in fact, a lot of leftists think that, you know, a lot of people on the left support really reactionary governments with this bizarre view that if you starve a population long enough, they'll revolt. Actually, if you starve a population long enough, 
they'll die. You know, there's always that possibility, you know. That's a problem. What happens, the Arab Spring, for example, so what's happening in Syria right now? We're sitting here in Syria, people are really dying for the right to do what? To walk over the curtain. Just go, I just thought doing that. Okay, now, this thing, telos, is very hard to break. It's in all of us. You're born as a little girl, you grow up to be a big girl. You grow up born as a boy, you grow up to be a big boy. And for those people that want to be something other than that, or they don't want to deal with the, what the social rules are, it's a tough climb. And I speak from experience. And I was growing up in the liberation times, so you can imagine how it would have looked. Now, if you want to make that break, there are two things you need to do says Kant and Foucault. The first thing is that you need to stop asking daddy for things. You have to stop it. You have to be, this is Kant, of course he didn't say stop asking daddy, it's a little slightly different way for that. I'll explain that in a second. Don't write like the way I'm talking, I just like it. <laughs> Don't follow me on this level, write very formally. He says, the mark of the first step of enlightenment is throwing off the yoke of going to the father. By father, he means the priest, incidentally. By father, he means God. What if God was not the only reason things happened? I mean, usually when something really horrible happens, your child is killed, you know, your partner that you love dies, uh, you know, you're assaulted, well, I don't know, something gross happened. At the end of the day, a lot of times God is, you know, all the you have left. He's just like, okay, well, I'm gonna pray now because I just don't want to do. And that can give solace. Derrida actually has a very good uh, thing on, he, he has this thing um, writing about uh, God saying, I don't know why prayer works, but it does. I don't know, we can go, we'll, we'll go back to that and get the kids done. Now, this God question has been put slightly aside as we've gotten further away from the printing press, as we've gotten further away from another great discovery, which was by Copernicus. Does anybody know who Copernicus is? Or what he did? What he did? Name? Uh, my name's Daniel. Uh, Copernicus. Uh, oh. Copernicus just uh, saw us thing. Yeah, what did he say? That's Galileo. That, yeah. That's Galileo, Galileo. <laughs> yes? The Copernicus the telescope? The telescope. Yeah. And what happened with that telescope? He gave it to Galileo. He gave it to Galileo. <laughs> Very good, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did he do with that telescope? What did he... What type of telescope did he have? He destroyed the Earth's <coughs> planet. No, that was Galileo. Galileo. He destroyed it. He destroyed it. <coughs> He destroyed the telescope? No. Interesting. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> wrong. I think it's felt like No. Okay. You, next one. I'm not going to tell you what it is because you need to know this kind of stuff. This should be stuff that this is like office party stuff. Okay. Just to learn. I mean, you, this is not a science class, so you're not going to have to really learn it. But just, just try and remember what Copernicus did. Yeah. Did he give it to the church? Did it? Did what? Give what to the church? Gave the telescopes to church. And what did he do when doing that? I mean, that's not what he's known for. That's not what the Copernican revolution was about. <coughs> so it's like he was afraid that the science of break will break what I wouldn't believe in. Yes, uh, yes. He, he had a hunch that his discovery might go against the church. And it did. Is he the one who said that the, the earth is, uh, is round and the story Who said that? Okay, name? Edna. Edna. Yeah. Name again? Anastasia. Anastasia. Yeah. Both of you are correct. Thank you. The world is not flat. This is very cool. Very important. He re now, now today, you think, <coughs> how stupid is that? People really did think that you fell off the edge of the earth. Of course, in certain societies, if you are bad, you will be excommunicated to the edge of the earth and beyond. And you will metaphorically, if otherwise, actually fall off of it, and you could conceivably die. Another, 
upbeat comment. Um, okay, sorry. So Copernicus realized that the Earth was round, and in realizing this, it meant that all the arguments about how you start here and you end there didn't work. That meant, if that didn't work, then that the relationship between the church and the state could be separated. And God could go off somewhere with the, with the church people, or the church people could go off with God. Right? And that would mean they could do their thing, but there would be a thing called secular society. And secular society was the first crack in an otherwise very difficult to crack sealed view of the world. It was the first crack, and these people died. <coughs> they were burned to death. They were hacked. They were ridiculed. It wasn't a good life. It was difficult. What happened? Now, what did Galileo do? <laughs> now we're back to Galileo. There. Hi, I'm Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Galileo proved that the Earth uh, went around the sun, and not the sun went around the Earth. And why was this such a tragedy? Because the end of the universe is interesting for the church. We are not in the center of everything. We are and created by a God who is supposed to be in the center of everything. And the, the, the love. The we are, God is mommy with the breast. Suddenly God is also playing with the planets, and there may be there's other life somewhere. You know, we're just like, hello. I mean, you know, what happened? It's not going to be acceptable. I tell you this because these seem very easy at the moment, but they were wildly crazy. Then. And by the way, Cynthia, that I talked about before, the single cell organism that was invented in 2010, is as crazy, and the Higgs boson as crazy. We're living through another complete jump. But I'll get back to that. So these really rusty kinds of ways of looking at the world came to fruition because of a number of patterns, the printing press, Galileo, the Pernican Revolution, and people started <coughs> getting in the ships and realizing, oh, yeah, I'm not going to fall the edge of the earth. What was weird is that somehow they didn't fall the edge of when they went around, and they always looked like they were on top. How did that happen? You're going like this, and how come you don't look like you're here? How is that possible? So these were all various questions. And so I asked the question, what is this thing enlightenment? Because enlightenment leads to a kind of prediction, a kind of prediction, a, 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 a supposing it could be otherwise. What would it look like? Any of you know anyone? You don't have to say first and sort Anybody know anyone that was ever in a terrible relationship? The only way to get out of it was to think, what could it be otherwise? Or that it couldn't be any worse. Sometimes you have to go there. You have to say, it just can't be any worse, even if it could be a lot times worse. You have to say, it can't be any worse, and that's what's going to get me going. So the first thing that, uh, uh, what's the thing? Immanuel Kant comes up with is that the enlightenment means that you know when to say no, not yes. It's the learning of how, how to say no. I'm not going to do it. And as soon as you learn how to say no, you get a little bit of power. A very little bit of power. A little bit of power. And there's different types of saying no, like lying in the street because the police are trying to move you. That's saying no. You know, the passive type of thing. Anyway, this, the first sight of the Enlightenment for Kant was learning how to say no. And when that happened, a distance got started. Cut. The first ability to say, no, I'm not going to my priest to ask for this. No, I'm not going to go to mom and dad to ask for this. Just no. The saying of no was the very first moment <coughs> a cut could be made. A tick. 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 And what Kant then develops, well, the three volumes and lots of stuff, is he, he, he develops his argument about what it means to be mature and what it means to be immature. 
you know, I mean, the thing about Kant, I mean, let, let's not over gild the lily with Kant. I mean, you know, he had slaves, you know, but like, so did Thomas Jefferson. I don't know if anybody ever heard of them. Has anybody ever heard of Thomas Jefferson? I always give American, when I was teaching in uh, from schools before I came here, uh, I'd give it American answers, and everybody would look at me like, <laughs> Jefferson, wrote the uh, American Declaration of Independence, had a slave bringing him coffee in the morning. Also had about 12 children with her, which are nobody seems to ever talk about either, but anyway, that's one of my irritations. Okay, now, so, so that we're on the same page here, Kant argues that to be mature, you learn to say no, and it begins this path, it sets you on your path, your teleological path, it sets you on your path of being a radical, autonomous individual. And he calls it radical, autonomous individual. Right? Right. Ah. Radical, autonomous individual. And what is radical? The word radical, so we're very clear on this word, next new word to learn. Word radical. Radi. What's the Latin radi mean? Okay. Is that social? No! <laughs> That's radius. Close. I mean, yes, you're right. Can you think of a, a kind of a garden version of this? It's the root. You said that. Um, and what's your name with hat? Aliwa. Aliwa. Eva. 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 Like the highway. Like the caribou. Like the caribou. Ivan. Ivan. Like the terrible. <laughs> Not the terrible. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Okay, I'm with you now. Great. Okay. All right. God, heck, that terrible. You have a really cool name with a very cool epithet attached to it. Nobody gets it. Like, the what? The camel? <laughs> the terrible. <laughs> the terrible. <laughs> Have you seen Eddie Izzard? Does anybody know who Eddie Izzard is? Yes. Do you ever see the one where he goes to the Starship Diner? Yes. The Lego, Lego thing? He's Darth Vader, he goes to the thing, to, to the Lego thing, and, and he says, you know, I am Darth Vader, he's done as Lego creatures. And he goes, I am Darth Vader, and the guy says, well, you're gonna have to take a tray because, you know, you're cutting in line. But do you know who I am? Is, yeah, you're, you're, what's he called? He's like, like, Bart. Vader. <laughs> the lady says, Bart Vader, Doc Vader. Doc, Doc, you, I own the ship. You own the canteen? No! <laughs> okay. So Kant says that you have to learn how to be mature, and that first stage of being mature, mature is to say no. And that saying no is a funny form of no, because it's not a no of I can't, it's a no of I won't. Very different no. It's I won't do it. No, I can't do it. I can't do it is actually the lazy version of affirmation to the father. I'm not doing it because I want someone else to do it. You'll, you'll do. So I can't do it is not the same as I won't do it. I won't is a form of drawing power to yourself. I won't do it. And that I won't do it was one of the first steps of how the body, one's own <coughs> body, became the sacred bit of ground, again, that ground thing, became the sacred ground for being able to do whatever you want to do with it. It was your body and no one else's. I mean, up to this time, it wasn't your body and no one else's. And in many cultures, it still isn't your body and no one else's. You were owned by the state, your family, somebody. But by saying no and stepping back just a tiny bit, you created distance. And that's the first step of enlightenment, creating this little tiny distance. Now, Foucault carries this one step further. Because Foucault is not a Kantian. He's not someone who believes in the telos. Let's think about this. You step back, and that begins to give you your path, says Kant. You begin to learn the saying of no as I won't. 
as opposed to I can't. In fact, Nietzsche comments on it by saying that in the saying of no in that way, you learn that you can say no. Because up to that point, often you don't even know you can say no. I used to ask people, particularly in the rape crisis centers I was dealing with, I asked people, what do you want? And, and they were like, this is wrong. You know, I didn't know what they wanted. And so we had to start with, well, what don't you want? <laughs> you know, if you can't figure out what you want, let's go with what you don't want. Let's go there. Start, start from what you don't want, then. There must be something you don't want. You know? This was the first step. The first step, you step back, and it gives you a way to go forward. You, you're on a path. You're on the process. And in saying no, in that way, in I won't, it gives you a goal. The goal is to learn how to say no, or the goal is to know what happens when that happens, and you walk toward it. So in the saying of no, the I won't, no I can't, Kant begins to develop how one's on a path, on the path of enlightenment. Now, we're going to park that, and I'm going to move over to Foucault. And Foucault says, well, there's one little thing that you need to remember. And that is, it's not enough, though it's at least important, to be able to step back and go, no, forward. To learn the positive nature of saying, I won't. What Foucault says is that in saying no, in this way, you learn the word exit. It sounds crazy right now, but to, in order to change things, you've got to figure out where the exit is. Where is the exit? E-X-I-T. Where's the exit? Where do you get out? If everything has a path, and you're on this path, this hamster path, this path that you can't see, you're just on this mad wheel, you got to get off the path. You have to get off the thing. And to get off the thing means there has to be an exit. You're going to jump out of a car. You're gonna ha how are you going to get off the path? Or how are you going to exit? What's your exit strategy? You're going to rob a bank? Better know where the exits are going to be in this room, and there's a fire, better know where the exits are. How are, you, how are you going to get out? Know your exits. Know that there are exits. Now, there's not always exits in the traditional sense of the doors open, go that way. But if, like the nine-year-old or 13-year-old or whatever she is, a uh, little girl in Pakistan, her exit is that she's trying to raise awareness of this problem. And in so doing, she's actually getting out. Of course, she got shot. I don't even know if she's alive at the moment. But there are these questions. Foucault is saying, basically, that you must understand that there are all sorts of ways to continue saying no without having to be on the path. And at the same time, without having to be floating like in the ether, like roadrunner, and you realize you've just gone off the cliff and then you're like, oh, it's not so good. There are ways of <coughs> exiting. Now sometimes you have to jump off that cliff because there just is no other option. Just got to hope there's water below or a pillow or something. And when there's not, you know, death. Okay, sorry. Another thing. Yeah, but are you going to be afraid of it? Well, of course you're going to be afraid. Well, most people are afraid. Of it. I guess there are some people who aren't afraid, but not most people. Now, so Foucault is saying, in order to know the exit. You need to know that there are limits. And here's where it gets slightly tricky. The limit <coughs> is like the tick, tick, tick. It's like the tick of the tick, tick, tick. But maybe it's not. Maybe the limit is the space 
between the tick, tick, tick? <clears throat> or was that just too horrible? Did I just go too far too fast there? Okay, think again. Limit. Okay, I want to. I want to go through this wall. <coughs> it's not going to happen, is it? I want to. I really want to go through this wall. I'm hoping and praying. Please let me go through the wall. It's not happening. How can I go through this wall? What's that? <coughs> oh no, breaking through. I can break through it. Yeah. So I can find. Yeah. Go around. Go around. Well, it's a long wall. Let's say it's thousands of miles long. Keep trying. Keep trying. <laughs> you think? You know that banging the head against the wall, the thing that breaks is your head, not the wall. You know? How do you go through that wall? Yeah. Very good. So you start using. I know that's kind of a trick question. I like. You start using your imagination. Now these days, you actually can go through the wall. You vibrate. They got to vibrate pretty fast. Okay. We're talking almost at the speed of light. Right? At the speed of light. So that's a pretty fast vibration. But how? Think about the walls of racism, or think about the walls of whatever the wall is that you've faced. I don't know. Your parents are being from me, or you don't have parents, or I don't know. You're, you're poor and you're starving. You don't do. You're gay. And, you know, whatever. What's that wall? First, you got to notice it. You got to know that there's a wall, and you got to be able to figure out how to fix it. Now, there are two strategies. Finally, we'll get to three because we'll get to dialectics. So there are two strategies so far on the table. One is the telos strategy. You have an acorn. You love your acorn. This acorn someday is going to become a great oak tree. You take care of the acorn, you put it in soil, you give it water, you do all the stuff. And in the end, the oak tree becomes what? Or the acorn becomes what? A tree. Okay. Because that is what it was meant to do. It is unfolding. It's unfolding, given its purpose of treeness to become exactly what it was always meant to be, which is a tree. And that thing tree comes back around and gives it its meaning, and also, by the way, lets you know how to deal with it. Lets you know whether or not you should, uh, I don't know, give it water or air yeah. or something. So that's that part. But what if, like I said in the thing, you don't want, in the, in the first lecture, you don't need to be a tree. Maybe you really do want to be a butterfly. Maybe you really do want to be female if you're male, or male if you're female, or straight if you're gay, or gay if you're straight, and, you know, Jewish if you're Muslim, or Muslim if you're Jewish, and whatever. Maybe you want to go to these jumps. Maybe you want to do this. Well, you can. But it requires a different path. And in any of these newly invented environments, because the path doesn't have its predictable telos, very difficult. You might fall off the path. And then what are you going to do? You're going to die. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I'm thinking about feminism, uh, for example. It, you know, in when I was a child um, last year, and the feminist movement was galvanizing in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and it was one of these things where, you know, nowadays it's considered, I don't know, they, they, they refer to it as political correctness or something. It was completely bizarre. But at the time, it was called, first of all, not the women's movement, but the women's sexual liberation movement. And then sexual got sort of flopped out, as these things do, because it was just too scary. And then it became the women's movement. But the women's sexual liberation movement, it was the saying of no, which led to the saying of yes in all different other ways. Like, you know, I'm not actually in the situation always saying yes. In fact, saying no, <coughs> I might not be making coffee. Little, little things like that started to, to matter. Now, I bring this in because it's one thing not to make coffee. It's another thing to then say no and know that you have <coughs> claws. Know that these are not just fingers. 
know that you are perhaps a lion. Know that if you know that, and you go into a place that don't like lions, that's going to be a problem. Maybe they want you for your skin. You've got a problem. You might be in a boardroom or in a gallery showing your artwork, and someone comes in and goes, what are you doing in here? It's stupid. Your work is stupid. Your work could be brilliant. But they're just gone. Because you, 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 I've got a claw. I've got a body. I can move this thing. I can go somewhere. And then you go somewhere, and everybody goes, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Out. So Foucault starts to, dis start to explain the kind of, and not just Foucault, I'm, I'm making this sort of, sort of political philosophy by numbers at this point. But, but, but after Kant and before Foucault, big gap, Foucault, you know, is writing in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, actually, he's dead, but he still keeps publishing. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, he um, there's a thing called the social, and the social or society or the rea or reality. That's always a good one. The thing called reality. Yeah, this is, you know, this is, you get down to reality. Stop you know, being such a dreamer. Yeah, reality. Reality in the old days of Telos, which aren't so far away. Go poses reality as a fully formed animal, like a ball. Think of a ball, or think of a football field, a square. Think of a ping pong table, just on top of the table. It's, reality is this fully formed thing. And if you break a section of the reality, you can go through that reality, that's a problem. Because then you're unreal, or I don't know, something's wrong. That version of reality, which goes with the zero-sum arguments, is called, sorry, which goes with the telos, is called zero-sum, S-U-M, zero-sum. And if you can picture a big round circle, like society being a big zero, it all adds up to zero, and you slice off the society in half, like this, then if you push them back together, it would add up to zero, right? So if you had one plus its other side, minus one, you add it together, you get zero. You get the whole picture. Zero sum is the whole picture. And a lot of people believe in that. Zero sum, male, what's the opposite of male? Female. Uh, workers, what's the opposite of workers? I don't know, bourgeoisie. Uh, you know, or depending on the society, serfs, other side, monarchy. Yeah, this kind of thing. So to understand the world like this in this so-called zero-sum game is to understand the first law of power. Every entity that has authority over any form of forming reality is going to try and create a zero-sum environment, always. Your painting is going to try and do this to you. It is always going to try and do this thing, and you would then decide when you're on this surface, am I, you know, pushing this, if I push this way, I can't go very far, because that's the edge of the society. But if the society pushes, comes back and pushes this way, I gotta go this way, so you know, either I push that way, at some point you can flatten all the way against the wall, but you can't break through, because that's the zero sum game. There's only so much power, there's only so much energy, there's only so much money, there's only so much what, blah, blah, blah. This is all based on a zero-sum game. And if you learn how to break through the wall of that reality, it doesn't hold power. And what Foucault suggests is that the second rule of enlightenment is learning how to break through the zero-sum game. That breakthrough isn't by necessarily chopping things down with an axe, although that could be. It is understanding that things have an exit. And that exit allows you to go forward. How are we doing? Dead? OK. What time is it? We're going to take 
10 minute break, seven minutes. Those of you that are still alive, please come back because I have just one more thing to say <coughs> and then we're done. Okay? Is that, is that fair? Good. You <coughs> did very well for the first, you know, part four lecture. Very well. to retreat, as it were. And if they push this way, then this group is forced to be basically mm -hmm. small. Okay. Now, so you have it like so if what what it's basically saying is that the sum of this part, so let's call this A and let's call this B, or let's call this A minus. Okay. So wherever A goes, A can't be. Okay. So the more that pushes that way, the, the smaller space A has and the more more A pushes this way, A minus A pushes that, the less space it has. And if you add that together, A plus minus A, you get zero. And the way that's referred to in the literature, this is not my thing, this is actually, it's called zero sum. And 
a lot of politics are based on it. Like, for example, all the politics that are going on today are based on this, that the mm. society is this finite entity, and you either go this oh, way or you go this way. As in zero, yeah. is the sum of things. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you have Good. zero sum. Got it. Good. As in yeah. zero sum, as in zero, zero. as in the whole. Sum. It's the sum <laughs> of yeah. those two opposing forces. Yeah. Like the ratio of yeah. and the yeah. and the yeah. So, like, for example, I mean, like I was saying, like, if you had a game, you know, let's say, football. Oh, thank you so much. So you can cover the game. Yeah. So, if you have uh, a game, and the game has just this motion, the team either goes that way, or the other team goes this way. And it can't go more than this way. And so therefore, their energy, one way or the other, way, adds up to all that there is. And all that there is is called zero. And this is a very traditional 